Good morning. If we haven't met, my name is Mitch, one of the pastors on staff. Pumped to be here with you this morning. We're going to continue in our Psalm series. We're going to be in Psalm 14 and 15. If you need a Bible, if you don't have one, you need one, so get one from the guys in the aisles. And we're going to jump in this morning. If I was in youth group uh, again this morning teaching on these these, uh, two Psalms, I would title this message Emo Music. Okay? And if you are older... Not old, but older, and you don't understand what that means. It means emotional music. Sad, depressing, weird, awkward, emo music. Middle school girls love it, okay? So emo music is where we're at this morning. Psalm 14, Psalm 15, both Psalms of David uh, that they would probably, he would, or even the people of Israel would sing together. Um, And it's weird, but it's good, it's important, we're going to learn together why that is. Psalm 14 starts, uh, the title says, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, now verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none who does good. And we start with... Possibly a familiar theme uh, or a familiar idea where David is, yes, calling out these people that don't think the way that he is or the people that don't live with him, people that come usually uh, up against David and his people. He says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Again, I want to be very, very careful this morning that we're not quick to be like, well, that's not me because I'm in church. I believe that there is a God. Now, we're not going like full atheist with verse 1. They're not, the fool's not running out in the streets and telling people openly, I don't believe that there is a God, there is no God, blah, blah, In his heart, he says, there is no God. It would be hard for me to say from the stage that I've said that in my heart. I will say from the stage, I've been very close to saying that in my heart. A familiar fear of what if, what if there isn't a God? What if all this is for naught? And I think possibly Christians and, and even atheists have this weird similar living sometimes in fear where we fear, well, maybe this is all for nothing and I'm called to live in this way for no reason. And then you have this possibly atheists believing, oh man, what if there is a God? But usually... I think we think this way, or we'll say in our heart, and some people will even get to the extent where they will say with their lips that there is no God because we don't want to be held accountable for the things that we do. It's more comfortable that way. We're going to talk a lot this morning about the difference between knowledge and understanding. And unfortunately for so many people, this is one of the hardest things to do is to get what we know in our head and actually put it into our heart. Take what we know and actually live it out and make it real. And one, unfortunately, one of the easiest ways that we artificially make that happen is through feeling and emotion. And we let what things, the way things make us feel, we let it trick us and be like, well, that's taking what I know and actually making me understand it because I feel a certain way. And David said, the fool says in his heart, there is no God because, man, it, would, it makes me feel a lot better if maybe I'm not going to be held accountable for these things that I'm choosing to do. That feeling, and I want to be careful again this morning that we're not quick to say, hey, that's not me. I'm here in church on a Sunday morning. Man, COVID's going around and I'm here in person. Good on you, yes. But this, Psalm 14, this is talking to us as well. You see it quickly changes In verse 2, it says, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Here's our emo music. Okay, now here's the deal. King James Version, when it was being put into English, kind of made things a little bit nicer for us, which is actually sometimes a disservice. 
Okay, so this word corrupt in this verse, it better would be translated rancid. Okay? No, no, we like corrupt. Corrupt is good. Corrupt can mean a lot of things. Rancid. Like God is looking down from heaven, right? There's this natural transition of people like, oh, I don't believe in God. Or if I do believe in God, I don't think he's involved in anything. He just like set us up like this world to go. And now he's a hands-off God, not paying attention. Right, a deist. Like, yeah, God exists, but I don't think he cares. No, no, no. Verse 2 says he is looking. And he wants to see if there's anyone who understands, not knows, anyone who understands, who seeks after him. Answer, not going well. The whole point that we'll get to, and the whole amazing point of this book, this love letter from God, is that he would want to know you and me, have personal relationship with you and me, and not just for a little bit of time, but for eternity. So he's looking down to his people, to his creation, saying, who wants to be in relationship with me? Have you ever put cereal in your bowl, gone to the fridge, grabbed the milk carton, poured it out, and it's chunky? That's what he's saying. God's like, you know, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be great. I'm looking for that good milk. It is lumpy and chunky. That's you. That's me. That's people. We're rancid. We're not just corrupt. We're rancid. We're rotten and we're broken and gross and disgusting, and this is what David is singing. <laughs> Excuse me? Maybe it's a poem, because for some reason poems can be like more dark and weird, and people think it's awesome, but he's singing. Nobody. They've all turned aside. They have together become rancid. They've become corrupt. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Verse 4, have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge. We take it for, I'm looking for understanding to, man, nobody even has knowledge. Who eat up my people as they eat bread, and they do not call on the Lord. There they are in great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Finally, in verse 7, we get hope. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Okay, here's the thing. This isn't something we usually like to dwell on as Christians. But the point this morning, as we study and as I'll show you even more, is that it is important for us as Christians to reflect on our sinful nature. Say, mission no, Jesus came, we're good, sin's forgiven, everything's great. Yes, true, absolutely. We are to reflect on our sinful nature. Now, don't misunderstand me. We should not be so focused on sins that we have committed. Because God says that sin is forgotten, that sin is cast as far as the east is from the west. And we as Christians, unfortunately, usually will allow sins in our past that God has forgiven, that God has gotten rid of, that God has paid for. We will, in our own head, dwelling on those, keep us from doing the will of God. Why would he want to use me? Because I've done that. He's like, Mitch, I knew you were going to do that. I chose you anyways. Let's go. That's forgiven. That's taken care of. I got it. And we get hung up on those things. I'm not saying we need to get hung up or think about those sins. We need to forget those sins like God has forgotten those sins. But we need to remember that we are sinful, that we will continue to sin. This is why this is here in Psalm 14. The craziest thing is, it's not just in Psalm 14. Psalm 53 is almost identical to Psalm 14. We could throw them up on the screens and you can see side by side how similar they are. We'll read Psalm 53 because we already did 14, but they're up there for comparison. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and they have done abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. Okay, iniquity works different. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. You have a difference in Lord and God in this verse. 
This difference between the Lord and God is actually very important, even in just Psalm 14. Because I think, and if you look at the first verse in both, this is not, oh, I don't believe that there are gods or little g God. God says when you think there is no God, you don't think, oh, there's not the idea of God or I don't believe in, in that. You're saying to God, I don't believe in you. He takes it personal. He says in Romans 1, there is no excuse. People have no excuse. You go stand before God and you're not a believer. There is no valid excuse that you can give him why you didn't. I grew up on an island when nobody ever came and shared me Jesus or anything. No excuse. Zero. Takes it personal. Not that people say there is no God. God, little g. The word is Elohim, this creator God. That people say there is no you. Serious, serious stuff. And you see a transition between when David says people say there is no God, and then he says in verse 2, the Lord, my Lord, showing relationship with this God. He is my God, my Lord. This is massive. Verse 3, every one of them is turned aside. They have all together become rancid. They're corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon God. There they are in great fear where, where no fear was. This is where we see the majority of difference. For God has scattered the bones of him who encamps against you. You have put them to shame because God has despised them. Give me, the, give me the next one. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when God brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. This captivity idea is extremely interesting. Because Psalm of David, this is written either when Saul is king of Israel or David is king of Israel. This is the golden age of Israel. They are not in captivity. At least not physically by some other nation. Not in captivity. So what is he saying when he says that the salvation of God would come and, and he would bring back the captivity of his people? Well, what captivity are they in? Well, they're in captivity of sin, of course. Old Testament. Sacrificial system that they're still needing to do. That they're still a part of. That their sins would physically, bloodshed of a perfect sacrifice, need to be atoned for. At this point, being done for the nation of Israel. But, they're in captivity even in this golden age. Their hearts, their souls are captive. And so amazing and incredible, this theme that flows, and we'll continue to look out this morning throughout Scripture, that the captivity of God's people would be brought back to Him. That yes, you were free to sin, but now you are a slave of God. As Paul would say, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. So this is the thing, you, you were his, this God Elohim, this creator God created you, created me, created everything. We were his, we walked away and put ourselves under another master. Sin, that master leads to death and death everlasting. And God says, I'm bringing you back to me. I own you. I'm going to purchase you again through the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to rebuy you. Still owned. Still under captivity. Just a way better master. And a way better house. Here's the thing. It doesn't just stop here in Psalm 53. Romans chapter 3. New Testament. You say, this is Old Testament stuff. No, it's not. This is Scripture stuff. This is New Testament stuff. Romans 3, starting in verse 10, says this. As it is written. Written where? Psalm 14. At least the beginning of what we're going to read. And then Paul starts to quote from other books of the Old Testament. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. 
They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb with their tongues. They have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is in their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace that they have not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know, verse 19, that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth shall be stopped and that the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You're like, Mitch, enough of this. Let's move on. Okay, fine. Psalm 15. Okay, Psalm 15, verse 1. Lord starts a lot better. Relationship. My God, that's what Lord means. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Now we're talking. This is the happy come to church stuff. Here we go, verse 2. He who walks uprightly, okay, I lose, and works righteousness, I'm out, speaks the truth in his heart. Uh, I just admitted I'm the one saying in my own heart, maybe sometimes when things aren't going good, there might not be a God. I'm out on that one too. He who does not backbite with his tongue, fail, nor does evil to his neighbor. Listen, I live in an apartment. That means there's people who live above me. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Sheesh. Nor does he take up reproach against his friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury or gaining it in any illegal activity, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. It's basically the same thing, just saying it maybe a little bit nicer. Okay, and what do we know? Well, if you're a Christian in the room, you know this is all pointing to a need for a Savior. Okay, but why is it repeated throughout Scripture? Listen, Jesus himself says, I didn't come to get rid of the law. Don't think that, Christian. I didn't come to get rid of the law. came to complete the law, to fulfill the law. It's not, I absolutely hate, okay, and this is a common thing in the Marvel Universe movies. I hate in these movies when you watch for like two hours and then all of a sudden they're like, hey, we found this weapon or this person or this thing that we didn't know about before and now we can defeat who we couldn't defeat for the last two hours and two minutes and everything's great. That's not what happens in the Bible. Okay? What happens in the Bible is you have this system, you have this law, you have this thing set up. Jesus comes and does it. He doesn't come and be like, hey, I'm the magic thing. I'm the magic man that doesn't need to abide by these rules. I'm just going to break everything and make a way for you to go to heaven. Absolutely not. He come and he, and he does it. He completes the lies. He accomplishes it. Take it a step further. Jesus says, hey, hey, you know when it says in the law, don't commit adultery? I say if you lust after someone in your heart, you're committing adultery. He takes it a whole other step further, stricter. Don't commit murder. You have hatred in your heart for somebody else. Same thing. We're taking it up a notch, Jesus says, this law thing. This law is important. Understanding your sinful nature is extremely important in your walk and relationship with Jesus. I, unfortunately, am one of those people where it's a lot easier for me to reach out to God in bad times than in good times. And have even like made it goals for myself in seasons. I'm like, I need to do a better job of recognizing, talking to, spending time with God when everything's going good. I'm real good at it when things are bad. Man, atheists reach out to God when things are going bad enough. So, so what are we doing? That's the point and the purpose of this. Why is it repeated in Scripture? Because you need to hear it, Christian. Because you need to live it, Christian. You need to go from, yeah, I know I'm a sinner, to I understand I'm a sinner, and I live knowing that I, that I want to sin, that this flesh, that it's a war, that I'm battling against myself. 
Jesus would say in Luke 9, 23, he says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. That this would be all the time. That yes, it's weird. It's uncomfortable. We don't love to think about that we want to do bad, that we want to do wrong. That we, in fact, are, yes, still sinners. But it is important, clutch, key, and an incredible opportunity for us as Christians to better our walk, to better our relationship. The more you realize you are still a sinner and that you still want to sin, the more you realize you're still in need of a Savior today, the greater that Savior in your life is. And the more you therefore should want to get closer to Him. I believe and yet don't live. I know and yet don't always live. That in moments when we're caught in sin by other people is one of the greatest moments and opportunities for evangelism in our life. But when someone says, hey, Mitch, I saw you doing this thing, and I don't think you should be doing that because you're a pastor and, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Our default is to be like, no, it wasn't me. I think you saw somebody else. They didn't do it. Or we like to justify why that might have been okay in the moment or whatever. How much greater would it just be? It's like, you know what, dude? You're right. I screwed up. I messed up. Here's the amazing thing. God knew I was going to do that. He wanted me anyways. He still wants me. He still loves me. He still chooses me. That's how good my God is. Because, yeah, I'm still going to mess up. It doesn't matter how much you've done, how many wrongs you've done, or how many wrongs you're still going to do, because we will still want you. What an amazing moment for, for evangelism. And you have David saying, not once, but twice in Psalms. Man, this is who we are. And the Savior that we need. And, and, and man, we're in captivity. And God wants to bring back that ca captivity through salvation. And we, and we know now, living post-Jesus, who salvation is. And he says, hey, you want to follow me? Deny yourself daily. Take up your cross daily. We were talking to his pastors about this passage. He's like, Luke is the one who includes that he says daily. The other gospels record this, but Luke says daily. And I was like, man, it's almost like a prescription from Dr. Luke. Do this every day. It's really from Jesus, though, so, right? Do it every day. Like, Christian, we need to actually realize because we are so broken, rotten, rancid, People, you know where else King James Version lets us down in the nicety of language? That our most righteous days are like filthy rags. Okay? You want to say that more accurately, King James, in your proper English? It would be menstrual rags, our best day. Not filthy rags. Real picture. That's our best. That's the best that we have got to offer. So why don't we think about our sin enough? Or our sinful nature enough? Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's difficult. Sometimes we get into this groove and this motor. Like, I can do it. I got it on my own. We get into those seasons. Where we're like, God, just tell me what to do. I'm going to go do it. I think God is so happy sometimes. Maybe not happy, but he's so willing. Better word to bring in moments of difficulty, seasons of difficulty, hard things into our life to turn our attention back to him. Sad but true. This is what it was all about. This is why salvation came. This is why Jesus came and died on the cross so that we could know and be in relationship with him. Not just so that we could go to heaven. I've said it before and say it again. The best part about heaven is that we will be with God. That has to be the best. 
It is the best. And for you, in your heart and in your mind, you can't just know that, but you need to live that, that that's going to be the best. So why am I wasting time now not living with God? Because as a Christian, this is the closest we get to hell. And the worst part about hell, the worst part about hell is that you will know God exists. You will know He made a way for you to live with Him, to know Him, to be with Him in heaven forever, and you cannot get there. Your time has come. Your time has passed. You had your chance. There was no excuse. Romans 1. And we messed it up. There's a, there's a whole lot of other things that are bad. In hell, that's the worst. There are no atheists in the afterlife. Everyone will know. Every knee will bow, Scripture says. Okay, let's look at one more thing. Romans chapter 6. Starting in verse 17. It says, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart, that from the doctrine to which you were delivered, and that having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, listen, you, me, as Christians are called throughout the New Testament, to live righteously. It's a call that's on your life and my life. To live well, Peter says, be holy. You represent Jesus. You're ambassadors of Christ. You are co-heirs with Christ. You are prince and princesses of heaven. You're called to live a different way. Well, how do we do that? Jesus tells us, he tells us in Luke 9, like daily, this is a daily relationship. Your reflection on your sinful nature should push you to have better relationship with Christ daily. Here's the thing, and so much of my focus as a youth pastor and a pastor and whatever is, man, I want to make sure that for myself, and for people that, man, we are staying and we are in relationship with Jesus from when we meet him until we see him face to face. Because it says in Psalm 15, man, the people that live this way, they're not going to be moved. I ain't living that way. I need Jesus. I need Jesus all the time. I need Jesus daily. Not just this one time that I that I understood or, or I knew at one time, oh man, I need a Savior, and then I'm living my life however I want. That's just knowledge. My parents would tell you I got saved when I was two years old, that I prayed the sinner's prayer when I was two years old, and I prayed it every week after that, all through children's ministry. Okay? I knew maybe that young that I needed a Savior, but no way did I live or understand or believe, which was reflected in the way that I lived my life, that I needed a Savior. I got saved sophomore year of high school, Tuesday, fifth period, Senior Viegas' Spanish class. No joke. That's when finally in my life I was like, you know what, I need to start living for Jesus. Up until that point, honestly, I was expected to live for Jesus. I had the smallest, tightest little Christian bubble ever, right? Pastor's kid, rising church, living in Encinitas. There's lots of spirituality there. It's like accepted, you know. And then Santa Fe Christian, right? Everyone just expected and believed me to be a Christian. And then I moved to public school. <laughs> Could have gone one of two ways. Praise the Lord, it went the right way. And I was sitting in this class, first day of public school, and I was like, man, nobody knows that I'm a Christian. Am I a Christian? <laughs> I could be whoever I want to be. And it was in that class, not paying attention to Spanish, 
that I decided I'm going to live for the Lord. See, he says that he's gonna, he, he needs to be Lord and Savior of your life. We're pretty okay a lot of times with the Savior part. Like, yeah, I'm not good enough, and I don't want to think about that anymore, so I'll take the Savior, but I'm going to go do my thing. You come with me. Right, I've said this before. This is my huge difference that I see between King David and King Saul, where, where Saul says, God, you're coming with me. Your blessing's coming with me. We're going to go do this thing. And David's like, Jesus, I want to be wherever you're at. God, I want to be where you're at. And I had to learn, I had to understand that that's what I needed to be. I didn't, I, it wasn't enough to just know. And I wanted so desperately for there to be like this feeling. I wanted to feel saved. Because I was this quote unquote, in my head, good little Christian boy. that never did re- anything really that wrong. I was like, no man, I need a savior. I re- reflect on my sinful nature. I need a savior just like the dude on death row needs a savior. And to understand better daily the weight of our sin makes Jesus and what he's done for us better daily in your life. I have this crazy, painful, permanent reminder uh, in my life of the difference between knowledge and understanding. Okay, and so... I broke my arm. That's my left forearm four years ago, almost four years ago. I'm out back here on the dirt at the church. Somebody who goes to the church still uh, donated a go-kart for the youth group, and I was like, sweet. <laughs> well, so I'm talking about, anyways, we had, you know, I was like, I don't know how safe this is. I don't know if I want, you know, kids on it, whatever, and we were investigating that. Um, <laughs> Took it to winter camp one time, and uh, I actually rolled it at winter camp with my brother in it with me. And uh, so nothing happened. We were all good. And uh, a couple of the kids on a Friday text me. It's late on a Friday. I was about getting ready to go home. They're like, hey, can we come drive the go-kart? I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Let's have, let's have some fun. It's Friday, right? So they come out, and I was like, listen, this thing wants to roll. I've already rolled it. And I tell them verbatim. If it's rolling, keep your hands on the steering wheel, because if you put your arm out and try to stop this thing, it will break your arm. (laughs) Said it. You can ask them. They're at Westmont right now, but you can ask them. Verbatim said, it will break your arm. One of them goes, great. Next one goes, great. My turn, right? I pop it up on the two wheels. I try to turn into it to set it back down. It's not going. I'm just sitting there, pause. I'm like, man, this is weird. I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm just going to reach out, push myself back the other way. It'll be fine. Because I wasn't moving. I was just sitting here like at a 45. It's weird. I'm turning the steering wheel. I'm still just sitting there. At least in my head, it seemed like it, right? I reach my arm out. My center of gravity then changes the whole thing because I put more weight outside. Thing starts to tip. I wrap my arm around a roll bar. Boom, snap. Now I've got two plates and 12 screws in my arm. Here's the thing. I knew exactly what was going to happen. I didn't understand. I didn't believe. Didn't live it. My arm was destroyed. I go in and get an x-ray. Right? I'm in there. Whole story. Crazy thing. Don't have time. I'm in there. My arm's like on on the... I'll just tell you. Okay, so... I put my arm on the table like this. And the x-ray chick goes, Okay, I need your arm like that. I, I can't do that. She's like, I need it like that. Like, so I turn half of my arm vertical, and my hand stays flat on the table. And then I have to grab my hand with my, my other hand and twist it up and get it vertical. She goes back. She's like, click. Oh, my goodness, the x-ray tech. <laughs> if you work at Palomar, please. This girl's awesome. She didn't do her job well, but she's great. Anyways, <laughs> she comes back out, and she goes, okay, now I need your arm like this. I'm like, can we have done that at the beginning? Anyways, then I'm like, am I going to need surgery? She's like, I can't tell you that, but heck yeah, you're going to need surgery. (laughs) So I appreciate her honesty. I knew exactly what was going to happen. I didn't live it at all. Why? How come? How come I couldn't get what I knew in my head to like actually perform? Be like, I knew what I, I knew what I was supposed to not do. And I knew what I was supposed to do. Keep both hands on the steering wheel. Let the roll cage save me. 
No thanks, I got this. That's so often our Christian life. No, I got it. She's like, no, 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 I, I'm the one who beats sin. I got it. And you're like, no, 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 I got it. <laughs> like, I'll just not think about it. I got it. And what the difference between me and like a pro driver? Daily practice. Daily repetition. These guys practice crashing all the time. And the moment they stop practice crashing is when they get hurt. I'm a huge Formula One fan. And my guy won this year. What up? But these guys are going so fast that when they lose control and they're going headed for the walls, most of them will take their hands off the steering wheel because if the steering wheel hits wrong on the wall, it will snap both their wrists in an instant. 200 plus miles an hour and that steering wheel just goes, whoop. They let go. They let Jesus take the wheel, okay? So they practice that daily, daily. You look at football. These guys practice basics all the time. That's why my Raiders lost yesterday, okay? Get it together, boys. The moment you stop practicing the basics is the moment you put yourself at risk. You know what the basics are of your relationship with Jesus? You're a sinner. You need a savior. You never outgrow that. And as long as there's still flesh on our bones and breath in our lungs, we're going to want to still sin. That's not going away. It's been paid for. It's been forgiven. But we still want to, as long as there's still days left on earth for us, we're still going to want to do wrong. And we need to remember daily that Jesus wants daily relationship and walk. And let's just go back to the basics. I'm a sinner. I need a savior today. That's the deny yourself part. Get yourself out of the freaking way. Not you, him. When people say, hey, Mitch, you shouldn't have been doing that. Absolutely right. Get me out of here. Let me talk about Jesus now. Because I'm a sinner and I have a savior. His name is Jesus. Let me tell you about him. I'm not going to justify why I did it. I'm just going to tell you I'm still going to mess up. And he still wants me. That how, that's how good my God is. It's not about me. Get me out of the way. This is how we better walk with the Lord and we better become who he wants us to be. This is why this shows up in Scripture three clear quoted times. We're not good enough. We need a Savior. It's not something we are supposed to move past. I was remember, I remember before I was even the junior high pastor, I was working in the graphics department. I heard one of the most, I don't even know what the word would be. I was so bummed out by, by something that was said. And there was a group of people saying we were doing, we were doing a very gospel heavy summer book study. Simple, basic gospel. And people were like, we're, that's too basic for us. Problems. Oh, man, I need, a, I need a Savior today. It's not like, oh, yeah, I knew I needed a Savior when I was two. I'm good. No, because I wasn't living. I didn't understand. I just knew. And it says in Psalm 14, verse 4, God looks to see who understands, who seeks after him. Not just someone who knows. That's just one little maybe baby step above the atheist at the beginning who's like, oh, yeah, there's a God, and I kind of know about him. I'm good. It's scary. So what's the response to that? Oh, daily, I need to be with him. Even possibly more than daily. Like, Mitch, I'm, I am with God daily. I'm good. Okay, do it more. That's what I kind of love about this whole thing in, in our relationship with Jesus. The answer doesn't matter if you're a new Christian today or you've been a Christian 100 years. Just more. Get better. Because... I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. So let's just all together, the answer is not different for each individual in the room, but just, hey, more. Back to the basics. And to realize um, what I deserve, being a slave of sin, what I deserve, that's been taken away from me. So now what's my response? Well, Romans would say and Paul would say throughout his letters to different churches, our response is, I am actually a slave of God. 
He doesn't call me slave. He calls me son. He calls me daughter. I'm co-heirs with Christ. This is the story, as I've shared, of the prodigal son where he realizes his sin. He comes back to his dad and he says, I know I'm a sinner. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to even be, I'm not worthy to be your son. I would love to just be a slave in your house. That's us. We don't even deserve that. And the dad says, God says, no, 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 you're my son. You were dead, now you're alive, you're lost, now you're found. Get the ring, let's have a party. Kill the pig, kill the cow, whatever it is. That's our God who wants to be with you daily. One of the best things that was ever said to me uh, in college, and this was not a good season in my relationship and walk with the Lord, but somebody said, Mitch, I don't know where you're at with God. Uh, But if you haven't been hanging out with him much, if you haven't been in your word, if you haven't been going to church, if you haven't been praying, like, don't feel like or don't think, and this is exactly how I was thinking, that God's going to be mad when you come back. Because what he did for you, what Jesus did for you on the cross is so that he could have a relationship with you. He is so stoked to have your attention. He is jealous for your time. He said... He said, it's probably like you start praying to him again, and God's like, oh, angels, check it out. Mitch is back. He's, he's talking to me again, pumped. What is the difference between knowledge and understanding? What is the difference? How do we take what we know in our head and actually live it out in our heart? So we're not just people that know about Jesus. We're people that understand, not completely, but a little bit more. We understand Jesus. We live for Jesus. This this relationship that we have is not just something we've tucked away in our back pocket in case God is real. But it is something that we believe, something that we live, something that impacts every decision we make in our lives Regular, daily repetition. Like I said when I was a kid, man, I prayed every weekend to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. There's nothing wrong with that. Could have done it daily to be like, I need Jesus today. Again and again and again. Because as nasty as my broken arm is, me as a sinner is so much worse than that. Broken, rancid, rotten, disgusting. My best day is filthy rags. Jesus says, Mitch, I want you. I want you now and forevermore. Let's not wait to get to that. Let's do it now, daily. You're doing it daily. Do it more. It was always my challenge to students, man. You weren't in your Bible at all last week. Let's shoot for one day. You were in it every day. Let's get twice in one day this week. Just get better. Get closer. And man, the more we live, the more we focus, the more we're daily and and, and practicing and, and in repetition of being with God, the more we can do and be the person he wants us to be. And you're like, yeah, I know that. I I hope you know it, but I'm trying so bad for us to get to live in that. I knew exactly what was going to happen when I reached out that go-kart. I did it anyways. I knew exactly what I was supposed to do, and I didn't do it. How do we change that? Is that so many of us walking around as Christians know what I should do, know what I shouldn't do. I'm just living however I want. Scary place to be because it's still the same. It's still true. The law is not gone. Yes, it's accomplished by Jesus, but sin still separates us from God. Now that sin is forgiven. That sin is paid for. But it does in our own lives get us into dangerous seasons and patterns. We sin, and it's us. God doesn't move. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're taking steps away when we sin. We're taking another step away. We're getting further. Sin still separates us. And that's a scary place to be. Nothing's going to pluck you out of his hand. But it's scary when we're living those seasons, those times of sin, through sin, and we're not coming back to Jesus. And that's in the seasons when we get in verse 1 where you say in our heart, man, maybe, is there, is there a God? Because this sin is fun. Yeah, for a season. That season may be the whole time you're on earth, but then it's not. Usually it isn't the whole time. What's the fix? What's the repair? More Jesus every day. Let's pray, God, I love you so much. I thank you. And God, we realize again this morning on Sunday in church, we need you and what you've done for us. 
those of us in the room in relationship or not in relationship with you the same. We need more of you. We need to choose you today and each and every day. God, you said before the foundations of the earth were laid, you were thinking about us. You had a plan. You had a way. You set up this whole thing so that we might know you. God, would we not wait for that or would we not know or have this, we hope, salvation card in the back of our pocket in case you are real. But as we grow and as we spend time with you each and every day, would you prove through your word and through our lives and through other Christians, through church, through all of these things that you use, God, would you prove your love and relationship? Would you show us new and fresh? God, would we desire to get closer Would we never desire to just maintain our relationship or say that, you know what, right here is good enough? God, you said that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And there will be those that never believe, and yet you have offered the same to them. God, would we be a light? Would we be a witness? Would we be willing to let our past sins be used for the glory of God? Would we not get hung up on them and keep those sins from doing your will today and tomorrow and all these things? But would we remember tomorrow, today, this week, that we still want to sin? We still want to go against God. James would say that we want to cheat on God, even as Christians. And God, in doing that and knowing just a little bit more how great a Savior you are, that there would be for us a better understanding. Not complete, but better. God, I love that we can from now and forevermore learn, know, and understand more about you every single day. So God, would we start doing that now? In Jesus' name, amen.